Peanut. All right, so we are live. Peanut, Hi. live now, Peanut. <laughs> Peanut might come up here. He hears his name. He's very sad because they're pouring concrete out front, and he's anxious. The noise is too much, and so he's laying oh. on his side right now, looking very desperate. Does he want to be out there with them? I, I don't think. I just want. I think he just wants them to go away. It's too oh. much for him. Mm -hmm. All those men, they might take me. He might. I might leave. Like, what's <laughs> happening? It's too much. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you guys. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Oh, Helen. Hi. She made it. It's her first live one. All right. Thank right, um. you. It's my highlight too. This is so fun. Oh, wow. You know. Jennifer, we need to talk. I was I grew up in Mequon, Wisconsin. You did? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, I don't think I knew that. No. Um well we'll let people trickle in here in the in the first couple minutes and um Yeah, I want to show off my uh, Tim bought me a present. It's my um camelback water hydrator, see? You know? <laughs> And I gotta remember not to squeeze it because I get water. So um, I was complaining to Tim how dry I get, and that I was like, I felt I was completely complaining about it, and and I was blaming my anxiety on it and everything. And um, and, the, and so Tim sent me a camel back. So now <laughs> I can really horrify my daughter wearing it around the house all the time. And when the mailman comes and the guys are out there working on that. I'm like, hi. Shh. <laughs> it's so good for my skin. I can. <laughs> I would love to see Meg's reaction to you. Oh, she's fed up. She's had it. Oh my gosh. I just, she's like, I don't want to morph into you anymore. It's enough. That's enough. <laughs> you know, uh, I make dinner. Well, so. um, <clears throat> All right, people coming in, Maggie, Nikki, Larry, thanks for coming again. Thank you, Maggie. This is a, definitely a highlight of our week too. Gives us an excuse to uh, shower. <laughs> our once a week shower happens on Wednesday. Um, Very true. Yeah. Um, Helen, Sandra, Lita from the UK again. <clears throat> Chuck from up north. <laughs> Manitowoc from Manitowoc. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know who that is. Um, I won't rat you out in case you want to stay anonymous, but that's great. Um, <clears throat> Ashley, Lisa, thanks for coming back. And Amy Lou, Maureen, yeah, it's great to see everyone returning. <clears throat> it is. Keep that tubing clean. Helen's oh, yeah. advice about the camelbacks. Good to know that. Yeah. I really have to examine my care, self-care of my right. back. Um, does it is it insulated? Does it keep it cold in there? Yeah. It's oh, amazing. Nice. Yeah. It's amazing if you want to be a crazy person. <laughs> you don't care. <laughs> if hydration is more than your sanity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's kind of all of us right now. I think it is. Yeah. I really was forgetting to drink, completely yeah. forgetting to drink. Like I would go, wait a minute, last time I had a cup of, it was when the morning coffee. And and then I would be like, why am I so tired? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, I don't have a thirst thing. It's a weird little thing. Um, yeah, all right. Well, we'll get started. Um, I just Barbara, can't Jennifer, right It makes me laugh. Okay. Kate, apologize for that email. I just sent you like the link and nothing else because I was in a hurry to, to get here. <laughs> so impersonal, that email. But um, Marty, Candace, Daryl, Madeline, Krista, you made it. <clears throat> um, yeah, Maggie, yeah. Camelback fixation would be a nice character quirk. It, it goes perfectly with my characters. <laughs> um. All right. Well, let's see. We'll get started here. Um, and uh, just want to talk kind of first of all about last time we um, just a reminder that we were uh, talking about the structural outline. Um, and Anne was kind of going over 
the one she uses, um, and there are many, and we're not necessarily a proponent of one, but mm -hmm. that the structural outline can just provide some guidance and a launching point. Um, but that uh, the way Anne works it is she sort of starts with that, but then really does a lot of uh, discovery writing or pantsing as she's going along because it's really the process of writing is about getting to know your character and how they are reacting to their world. And, and you may also discover like there are some obstacles or conflicts that you want to introduce that push them uh, in a new direction or a different direction. So it's a, it's a launching point, but it's not something that's obligatory to adhere to, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Nothing is obligatory until the book is actually done, right? R right. Yeah. I Which mean, is part of the problem, right? I mean, that's the thing with everyone. You kind of crave limits. The thing, the, the infinite possibilities is kind of like suffocating it sometimes. Mm -hmm. It right. is. Yep. Yeah. I think is why then people are really hungry for these plot points. They really want to know, like, okay, it's my story. I have the character, but just give me some guidance on how to structure this whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, because you know it's going to be eighty thousand words, and that's a lot of words to write. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So yeah. So I think it's really understandable that we, you know, we really want to know, like, okay, what does this author think are the essential plot points and when do they come and and how do they is there some sort of qualitative different difference between how they push a character etc and um it's all very understandable that you would want that and and i wouldn't say like don't research it i would mm -hmm. say like go for it and learn some of this stuff but you also kind of need to as with a lot of rules you kind of need to like learn it and then kind of you know forget it as you're employing it in, in mm -hmm. a sense, right Right, and I think when we're talking about structure in many ways, what we're really talking about is pacing. And um, and and that is one of the hardest things um, because, yeah, um, that's a good question, Lisa. We'll get back to you in a second. But um, I think that, you know, what we really want is for people to understand that the plot points allow us to have pacing that varies our intensity so that you're not feeling like both having a heart attack or taking a nap in the middle of the book. Um, and pacing takes some time um, to really figure out, and at least you have a little bit of a structure to get you thinking about it. And that's really what structure, in my mind, that's what it is. You mm -hmm. know, so. Right. And people are hungry for plot points. As she said, our readers hungry for plot points. Readers are hungry for see, for conflict. They want things to change. They want it to keep going. They want it to, um, anything that slows too much without any kind of conflict and people are skimming. Um, right, and I would say readers are hungry for some of the things that, that structural plot points are meant to supply. Yes escalation pacing um momentum you know pushing the character toward change and transformation yeah. yeah but it's those things that are more important than the plot points right it's like signage for the writers and excitement for the readers like interest for the readers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and it's always the same like if you're watching two people next to you and they're fighting you really want to see who's winning you want to see <laughs> who's making the best points, like what their deal is. It's kind right. of interesting, but it's not very interesting if all of a sudden they stop fighting and they get along. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so that's kind of where we think of as far, that's why we have this, that's why we talked about structure in that way. Right. And honestly, I don't think you can really work on the structure of your book until you really have a good idea of who your character is and what they want and where they might be going forward because you can't put obstacles in their way if you don't know what the obstacles are that are gonna be their Waterloo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Tim and I, we get together every weekend um, on the phone and we talk about what we're gonna talk about for, unfortunately, I also make Tim talk about all kinds of things like hair products and camelbacks and things he's not at all interested in, but he absolutely has to put up with. And so, 
but then I was, then I said to him, okay, so we're going from, you know, what do they want to structure? And now we're going to start writing this summary, this pitch. And then I thought, I said to him, well, there's something between those bits and the pitch that is the miracle and um, that is happening. And I wanted to spend a little bit more time in that miracle space because I feel like often when people are talking about how to plot a book and they talk about, you know, these point structure, et cetera, we lose this piece that has to be explored that is the miracle of the story, the emotion of the story before we get back into the nuts and bolts of writing a pitch that also has to have a structure to it. So, so I said, you know, I was reminding Tim of this um, cartoon by the far side and it says, I think you need to be a little ex more explicit in step two. And in step two, if you can read it, it says, is it, this is a mirror, this is where a miracle occurs. Then, then a miracle occurs. Then yeah. A miracle occurs. And, um, and I think that that's the, that's a piece that, we wanted to really kind of explore so that later then when we talk about the structure of a pitch and how to write it correctly, we've at least said that it's not just knowing the character, keeping it universal and clear, then and then put it together with these plot points. But this miracle is the art. Um, right. And then there is the structure of trying to talk about your art. Um, and so this space today is kind of a mix of, let's talk about the miracle, the gap, bridging the gap before we start to walk up into this space of writing a technical pitch. And I, I think that that's what's missing. And the reason it's missing in everything I've always done is that it's nebulous. It's a little hard to grab and it's your magic. So it's right. hard to talk about your magic. Right. Um, and I always use the gruesome analogy of, you know, if you had all of the pieces of a dog laying around and you sewed them all together, you still don't have a dog. He's, you know, there's some miracle thing that creates a human or a spirit or a moving dog. And that is the magic of your story. You can have everything, but if you don't have this glory that, you know, that is the rest of the art. Yeah. Um, then, then it's difficult. And and that I we can, I can't teach that I guess, but it's definitely needs to have a nod. We need to nod to it. Right. Right. Because people will say, "I've done everything. I did everything right. I followed all the guidelines. I've done it. What's missing?" And yeah. um, I, and you know, sometimes it's that. Um. And I'm not sure what that is yet. I can tell you when I see it, but I can't always. Right, right. You know, and again, like you're so you're working on these edits for this this latest novel of yours, uh, which will be your fourth published novel, but what the sixth or seventh you've written. written? Yeah, and and you're still like that's still it's about kind of finding that magic, right? You're yeah. still you're still doing that right now. Yes, yeah. as you're working on the. You know your deadline, which you thought was this Friday, but is actually next Friday. Yeah, which I literally was dragging myself around, saying, "Oh my God, I'm not hydrating enough. I'm going to call my editor and get an extension." Oh my God! And then my daughter said, "Mom, the, the date, the twenty second, is next week." I was like, <laughs> "Like I was a ridiculous person." It was like I heard, found out that final exams were not going to happen or something, and all of a sudden <laughs> I was skipping down the road. So. I guess to, and I will also tell you right now that I had a moment today where I thought I have no business telling anybody how to write a book. Um, <laughs> I think most of us sort of feel that way. Um, and if nothing else, I hope that uh, that you come away from this going, okay, it's okay for me to feel a little bit fuzzy here. Right, right. Do, this is hard to do. So with your so this book that you're currently working on, and just yeah. to kind of reiterate both the miracle thing and the whole process here, it's called I Thought You Said This Would Work. Mm -hmm. And you came up with this pitch 
um, basically you came up with, you know, a, a back cover synopsis sort of pitch, right? Yeah. The paragraph yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is kind of from the first, uh, our first session of right. several weeks ago, but you came up with that. You, you had a log line, you had some comps mm -hmm. and then you have, you have like a 2000 word um, <clears throat> structural outline of the thing mm -hmm. with actual headings like uh, pinch point number one and midpoint and mm -hmm. climax and stuff like that. Yep. So, yep. but you begin the whole thing with this notion of like, well, here's the premise and here's the character and here's what they want. Mm -hmm. And here's the way in which they might change. And here are some of the conflicts they might face. Mm -hmm. And and we were talking this last weekend about how that really hasn't changed. Nope. That has remained in sort of the foundation of the entire book. Mm -hmm. Even now, as you're kind of still working on creating some of the magic um, and and getting that emotion on the page and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Even now that hasn't changed. And the structural uh, outline, I don't know if that's changed, but it, it, it might. Like there's a little more wiggle room actually with that. There is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, some of the last third of the book is changing a little bit. Um, yes, and I wish I could talk about a different book. Um, but this is... <laughs> I'm deep into this one. Like I'd love to to be like, you know, talking to you about a book that you've all read, or I'd love to talk to you about somebody else's work. But um, since I'm so deep into it right now, it seems like this is the only way that I can talk about it. Right. So what was the genesis of this story for you? So, so I was sitting at dinner. I like to cross pollinate my friends, which is not always great. And um because I like, a, I always say I like a good weirdo, but not all my friends like a good weirdo. And um, I had two friends sitting together and, and I was thinking those two would not be friends without me. And what if they got scuffed in a car together and had to find their way around? Like my girlfriend and I always, she always says that if we were in the amazing race together, one of us would die. Um, even though I like her very much, I would make her crazy. There's no way that she could do a race with me. And um, and so I was thinking about that and I was thinking, so, you know, how would it happen that two people have to do two people that don't really like each other have have a mission that they have to get across country um, to save a dog? And how is this going to happen? And so, you know, I created a threesome that were friends in college, but they had a falling out and lost each other, um, except two of them stayed friends. And the one has, um, she's out of remission with cancer and her ex-husband took her beloved Great Pyrenees um, to California and she wants her friends to go get it. And really she's she's got a lot of friends but not a lot of friends are gonna drive across country to save your dog. Um, and um, so, that's, so that's where it came from and I thought, well, the, only, the, the way that somebody would do that, there's lots of reasons. Like I made it a great Pyrenees so that it can't be necessarily safely shipped. I made him afraid uh, he's diabetic. I made him afraid of little cars. I mean, I made all these very hard things so that everybody has to be forced to go get this animal. Mm. Um, now the woman who has cancer, the, the one that's the glue to that threesome, she can't, she's sick. And so she's not gonna be in the car. She's mm -hmm. not gonna be traveling there. And so um, then I started thinking, well, what would be so bad that these two people had a falling out that they could not come to grips with? And, um, and then I thought, what does my character want more than anything? And, you know, really she's in the midst of a tough time in her life. She's a widow. She, um, her daughter is going away to college and she's going to be gone for good for the most part. And her best friend is probably dying. She has devoted her whole life as a single mother to taking care of her um, daughter and uh, doesn't really want to put herself when she lost her husband, doesn't want to put herself into a situation again where people are going to die and leave her. Um, and so so what she really wants is to get this dog and save her friend's life, or at least have the dog available to her so she can comfort her. 
Um, but what we find that she really wants is to not be alone in the world and to um, and what if it what if she is going to be alone in the world? How is she going to chase or change her life so that she's not? And you have to ask the question, why is she alone? And you have to create a very plausible reasons why this woman has kept people, you know, away from her. So that now she's dwindled down to just a daughter who's leaving and a best friend who's dying mm -hmm. um, with memories of having other best friends when she was in college. And now and that friendship is ruined. And now she's got to be stuck in the car with this ruined friendship. And she doesn't know exactly why it was ruined. And um, there's some other things like, uh, you know, it happened back in the 90s when they were in college. And back in the 90s, you couldn't just text somebody and figure out where they were. In fact, you had, remember when you had those phone cards and you had to dial in those numbers, you know, and, and often you couldn't get a hold of people. There was no way to get a hold of people if they were in internships, you couldn't call them. Um, it's not like we were very, in, in our day, I didn't even know the parents of my friends in college. Mm. I, I don't think I I'd hardly met them. I certainly didn't know them enough to give them a call. Yeah. So. So all of this has to go into the story um, because you have to figure out, you have to, Tim said it so well, I love how he said this, that you're working both forward and backward in the story. So every place you want to go in the moving forward in the plot has to be substantiated by stuff behind, either history or memory or and you have to show it because it's not enough. Like if I, if my friend called me up and said, you got to go get this dog and you got to go get him with her. I'd be like, okay. And, and even if we had a falling out, I'd be like, well, we'll figure that out. It's fine. I mean, she hates me, but we got to do it. And I'd be like, I'd probably say to her, we got to work this out, mm -hmm. but it's not me. In the I'm creating another person mm -hmm. and I have to be really good at it because I am convincing my readers that this character can't manage it so, and so my craft it comes from there too and so what i'm hearing a lot of you in your in you talking about this i'm i'm hearing a lot of like either implicit or explicitly asking why right there was a lot of like why would she need to do this why would she be trapped in the car why would it be this kind of dog right like why would yeah. why just why would this scenario be plausible and authentic. Yeah, and you guys, we're gonna ask you to ask us some questions. We're gonna shut up too a little bit later and let you guys sort of ask us some questions for that because what I find the most useful is when I'm helping someone work on their pitch or I'm helping them work on their story, I'm pushing them constantly. Well, why would that be? Well, why? Why don't they just, why don't they just fly out there and fly out back with the dog? Well, why don't they, why do they have to drive it back in that certain way? Like, right. what's the big deal? And um, because that's what the reader is thinking the whole time. And so you have to sort of have those questions answered so that Absolutely. you can write forward. And in some of, in our previous session, mm -hmm. like the one where we talked about this, you know, this bag lady premise where they there's the bag by the dumpster you know, that's essentially like what we were doing very roughly is sort of delving into all the possibilities with this story. And and then, but that's what, to be clear for people, like you did a lot of that with this concept before you wrote mm -hmm. down this pitch and before the outline, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was just where, because I was working on a different book that didn't get published um, because it was outside of my genre. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was working on it in the back of my head all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and then I, like, I, I actually, before I even knew too much about it, I flew to Utah to spend some time at the best friends animal sanctuary. Cause I knew that some of that was good. They were going to stop there as a pit stop. Mm -hmm. And I spent a little time there because I, I knew that I was going to need that for writing forward. And I knew you know, I knew a little bit that I was going to have to figure out who are those people that love animals that much, mm -hmm. even more than I love animals. I really love animals. So, um, 
So all of that, you know, when we talk about research in my mind, I don't write, um, I, and I'm, I'm so in awe of people that write historical fiction. I, you know, I, I do a different kind of research. My research is what's plausible. Who are these people? Where are they going to be? Are those places real places? Are am I making them up? That kind of thing is my research versus the kind of research that you have when you're working on a certain era. Um, it's all research. And I, maybe that's the way it should be thought of, that it's all research. Right. If we put it into, you know, a word like I'm doing research, and then when you're staring into space and someone says to you, why aren't you writing? Krista, <laughs> you know about this. You can say, I'm doing research. Yeah. I'm doing research in my head. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you have this uh, story idea, it, you, the genesis of it, you explore it quite a bit. And do you mind, can we show <laughs> this pitch or the... The synopsis. Yeah, go ahead and show it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just take it apart a little bit too. We can take it apart. Sure. So Samantha Holton and Holly Dunphy have two things in common. It's not Samantha's unwavering confidence, conf conflict, or unwavering confidence, conflicts avoidance will lead to a happy life. I don't. I think maybe confidence shouldn't be there. Um, nor is it Holly's take no president prisoners' attitude or blistering sense of humor. Nope. The only thing they have in common are that they despise each other and they love their best friend of 25 years, Katie, their shared roommate from college. So right there, we have a setting. We have characters. Probably those two are going to both have an arc. Um, it tells you a little bit about each character and it pits them against each other immediately because they despise each other. So right away, they have a conflict. Um, but, and you can see already that there's something's going to be going on with Katie because they both want to be Katie's friends. So there's a small piece of conflict there. And then the next thing is the trouble with is Katie Martin's cancer's back with a vengeance. Neither Samantha nor Holly can imagine a world without their friend in it. And the two frenemies would do anything to make Katie's life better, even travel cross country together to save Katie's diabetic great Pyrenees from euthanasia and bring the dog home. To succeed, they have to steal Katie's ex-husband's Winnebago, locate the dog, brave prejudice, a violent trucker, and their own crappy history and narrow-minded thinking. But neither woman will do Katie any good if they don't confront a secret from their past that has weakened their bond, a bond that if strengthened could be enough to save them all. Mm -hmm. So what you have is a premise, right? The premise is these women are stuck in a car together. Right. And then you have a desire. They love Katie and they'll do anything for her. And honestly, what that premise, that whole bit is saying, what Katie needs for them to do is get along. It's not even saving the dog, mm -hmm. although that's the external goal. What Katie clearly wants is those two fr things, friends to be friends again. Not only is she going to need them, but if she dies, they're going to need each other. So all of this is very universal because we understand what it's like to fall out of friendships with family, with our friends, with all kinds of people, and, um, and to want something mm -hmm. and to even have a common goal with somebody that you don't like that much. Um, and then, and, and, you know, you put in what they're going to see so that so that the agent or editor can see that you understand that there's going to be roadblocks that speak to their desires. Mm -hmm. And that in the end, and so you can also see how flimsy the last bit is in terms of plot. Like this to succeed, that tells you a little bit about the story, but then there's like the denouement, which is like, and we hope they do it. Right, right. So, so that is, um, but you could, if you look at the whole thing, we wouldn't see the whole story structure in there. We're not seeing midpoint reversal. We're not seeing pinch point. What you're seeing is the general desire of a person in a setting, what they want, what's in their way, and how they're going to, what they're going to have to encounter to get to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And then a question, are they going to do it? Which, of course, usually they do. But something, or they get something else. But then, so then you're going to move from this to that larger sort of structural outline. Mm -hmm. And um, and what I say, what I wrote in this slide, employ an understanding of structure or at least structure's underlying purposes. Um, 
And I just want to talk a little bit about some of the purposes here of structure. And I think this was something you said to me on Saturday, that structure marries a character's desire and the roadblocks and lays out a path for those roadblocks to alter the character in the most meaningful way. Did I say that? You said something very close to that. I may have added oh. something at the end there, but. I must have been hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. That, that's pretty good right there. Character's desire in the roadblock lays out a path for these roadblocks to alter the character in the most meaningful way. Yikes. That's a tattoo waiting to happen. <laughs> That's a good one. The writing geeks uh, bumper sticker. Yeah, I know. Geeking <laughs> out. Yeah. Um, and that this meet like what is this most meaningful way? Like they're they're awakening. We we attempted a few of these, but they're awakening to a truth about their own existence. Um, mm -hmm. You said this, but I love this concept. They're clutching onto a security blanket that doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a way of life. So I like I was thinking about it. Um, I was actually thinking about that a little bit when after I said that. It's a little bit like, you know, if your bed is too small, you're pulling it up on one side and then your butt is hanging out and you pull it over here and your knees are hanging out. And that's kind of what's happening in this. I think their coping mechanisms are not working anymore. Mm -hmm. And little by little, they're not getting what they want anymore. Mm -hmm. So they have to change what they want or change the blanket. And um, and that's exactly what happens. Which <laughs> then influences how you're thinking of those roadblocks because they're not just they're not just problems. It's not just the flat tire. It's something that's going to exacerbate this issue with their security blanket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Little by little, the character has to change to get results. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so those roadblocks again are gonna spur them to change. And then you mentioned, um, I really liked this too, that um, structure is skeleton, which is a metaphor we've heard before, but you kind of um, added on to this by saying, um, sure, you can have a unique structure or something that maybe isn't even a story. Like there's other writing that's valid and people find interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, and you say like a paraplegic is still, it sounds like it's gonna be a disability joke and it's not. A paraplegic is still interesting, but just doesn't deal well in a world built for an upright primate. Right. Gosh. Gosh, you were really, you were really on. You were on, on that day. Right, weren't you? <laughs> wow. Too bad I'm not quite as bright for you guys in person now. But actually, <laughs> but that is true. Like. I think that that's, that's what we have to think about as this structure. We're trying to give you the best that we can do to give it to you. But there are different ways that you can use that structure. Right. Right? We're used to one kind of story, but there's lots of different stories and lots of different structure. And it's right. all based on the most interesting is what – are they happy? Like when you're talking to your friends and I, I just want to keep, I don't, I wish that you guys could talk to us, but like, I, I love the idea and I use it frequently. Like if I am trying to figure out of a story to tell, I just try to tell it as if it were a true story to my friends. And, and they would say to me, well, is, are they happy? Like, did that what they wanted? Like, I know that when my daughter, my friend will tell me a story, I'll be, I'll have to wait to respond because I'll be like, are you happy? Like, is that what you wanted? And then if there's somebody like, no, then I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't think so. What are you, what's next? You know, or yeah, I mean, that's what they wanted. So are they stopping? No, they have to keep doing this because X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's the way that we all inherently tell stories, but we forget because we're trying to describe a smell or something. Like right. we forget our, how to tell a story because we're working so hard on writing it down and in sentences. Right. So like right. I, I know that you guys all know how to do this because you do it every day. Mm -hmm. Some more compelling than others. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the pitch, the pitch um, is uh, again, we're talking about doing something, this pitch early on and then kind of revisiting it throughout. And then of course at the end kind of, looking back at it and polishing it. But yeah. um, like yours, really, your 
yours, like you said, didn't change from that first iteration till now. Right. But just again to clarify, the pitch is pitch is a word that either signifies this like 100 word or to 250 word synopsis that you would use in a query letter. And we just looked at the pitch basically for um, the, your most recent book. And mm -hmm. it's 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 you either have that as part of the query letter as kind of the hook. It doesn't give away the whole story. It mm -hmm. just sort of says, as you say, it's a come hither, right? Mm -hmm. um, or it's what you might verbally say to an agent or anyone else who might be interested. And so, you know, that's what the pitch is. And are, are we jumping the gun with kind of doing it early in the process um, or not? And, and you've talked about how it's really helpful for you because it helps you just sort of wrap your head around. Right. This is the core of the story, right? Yeah. Because I do need, like, I wish I didn't need that, but I really do need that. Um, I need to wrap my head around it. Um, it allows, it helps me put structure into it. Mm -hmm. And it's a living document, so it can change. And what we were saying on Saturday is that you um, you almost, like, use the process of writing the book um, as, like, you do that. You write the book in order to figure out how the character, um, basically, how the character can endure uh, this whole journey that pushes them in the way you originally envisioned. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, you know, you know, I've used this quote before, and I'll use it again. Joan Didion says she writes to learn out, figure out what she's thinking, and interestingly, and not on purpose. I have been trying to figure out why I'm so bad at conflict and has have always been bad at conflict. And actually at the center of this book is this woman who is trying to get better at conflict. So mm -hmm. I certainly didn't start out thinking I want to write about a book about conflict so people can figure out how to be better at it. I didn't. But I am intrigued at two friends driving across country who don't like each other. Now, I feel like there are people that are strong enough to be like, I don't care, I would just get it. I wouldn't necessarily make friends with them and I could manage it. But I guarantee you put me in a car with conflict, getting something done and my hair will fall out. That's how much I don't like conflict. Mm -hmm. So for me, conflict, is a big deal. So I have to, for those of you that are think conflict is not a big deal, I would have to sell you this character so that you understand why conflict is so bad for her. Mm -hmm. But for those of you that are like, I get it, I don't like conflict either, then this is a chance for you to take a look at, you know, how do how do people do it? Mm -hmm. And um, and that's where I got that's what I realized as I wrote this, what I was really exploring is the exploration of why we're terrible at conflict. And, you know, the book Crucial Conversations has sold thousands and thousands of copies because people are bad at conflict. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, and so it's a, it's a universal problem. It's particularly a problem for women. Um, um, and I would imagine women of a certain age because we grew up trying to be nice girls mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that some of our value was in our niceness. Um, and then, you know, we didn't get always what we deserved because we didn't ask for things. Mm -hmm. So I'm spending a lot of time thinking about those topics as I'm writing this because I have to explore deeply and, and why this character is so bad at conflict and i have definitely found out some things about myself during that writing of it we're not the same she's got a very difficult father and i had not the easiest father but nothing like this character mm -hmm. um and i think that that's what makes you know i feel like i'm this time around i feel a little like my book is therapy but honestly i wrote about a mother with alzheimer's um, before my mother was very sick with Alzheimer's and it helped me deal with her Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, wrote about fairness and grief and loss. And all of those things are things that I really like to take a look at and tend to be things that I'm dealing with at the time. I think most writers would probably say that to be true, unless you're writing, you know, certain things. Yeah. 
maybe don't have that much exploration associated with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think you said to me a while ago, like a, a year or so ago that, um, it's interesting how much writing a pitch is like therapy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it, have to figure out, I think our first question was, why are you so interested? Like, why are you so interested? Uh -huh. Remember, like, one of our first things in that thing, I have it right here. Like, when did you think it was a good idea? Why do you care? Right. And I think, because I care about conflict, but other people don't care. Yeah. I've seen people who are amazing at conflict, absolutely unruffled by it. And I'm this the whole time. <laughs> Nervous giggle. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Right. Um, so I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this pitch, I really like this concept. The pitch is essentially a description of what you need to figure out in writing the book. It's both the starting point and the sort of end destination. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so like what, what's needed in the pitch and we've kind of already talked about this and seeing your example of it. And, and I attempted this twice and one is just a list of like the elements in the pitch character, their situation, their sort of current situation, um, their desire, uh, their obstacles, and then a question about whether they'll let go of their security blanket is kind of mm -hmm. the way using your language here. Stated as a sentence, a premise um, which situates a character who has a desire and then over the course of meeting with obstacles to that desire will be faced with the question of whether to let go of the security blanket that is failing them. And I'm using that language of the question because that's really how the pitch ends. It doesn't answer that question. It says, you know, will she, uh, you know, will she come to terms with uh, X, Y, or Z, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it phrases that as a question. And a lot of stories, probably the majority of the stories, the answer is yes. Um, this is, you know, a story of triumph. We probably slightly prefer those to tragedies, but she doesn't have to. Like, they don't have to. The answer can be no. Like yeah. tragically, no, they didn't. Yeah, the def it definitely can. Usually <laughs> the ending has some sort of satisfying ending, you know, like they may not don't get what they want. It's like that one, you know, the stone song, you don't you don't always get what you want, but you get right. what you need. And that's actually you know, every once in a while I hear something different like that, and I'm like, Yes, that's right. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get what you want, but right. maybe you do get what you need. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So, so Andrew, he says, have you started out with your protagonist going in one direction, then take a big detour to a place you didn't originally imagine? Well, a lot of, yeah, there's a, like, I don't really know what everybody's going to be doing all the time. Like I just mm -hmm. have this general thing and I have some ideas that are going to knock them off their beam. Um, but like I said before, I, I had a character show up that I didn't know was going to be a character and she's the main character in the book now. Um, and for the first time, this time, I'm actually changing large plot points in the very end of the book. Mm. Um, a couple of things have changed pretty largely, and that, that hasn't happened before um, when I'm writing. I don't love that. Mm -hmm. It's really hard, but <laughs> I, I think it's right. I think it's correct to do it. Yeah. Um, and that's when I have to call my people and, and talk ask them questions about it so that I can hear myself talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I also hear myself say, why am I doing this? I hate writing. And then <laughs> right. this is so hard. Why would anybody do this? It's a misery. And then I don't know, I get a nap in and I feel a little better. Yeah. So uh, what makes a pitch effective is kind of the next place we're going to go with this. And I, I actually think we're going to allow just a few seconds of dead air here from us as we allow you to um, talk to us right now about the story you are writing. Um, we'll, we'll pretend to listen and we won't hear you at all, which is a pretty good simulation of what happens when you tell people about the book you're writing. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, so actually we, we actually want to do this. So take like just a minute to, you know, if you can just... Uh, I guess if there's people around, just move your lips silently. But otherwise, uh, actually talk to us. Talk to the computer screen here, and we'll 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 pretend like we're listening. Sure it will not. Oh. Hmm. 
I want to hold up a sign that says silence is hard for me. Right. All right. Well, maybe interrupt you there. Um, <clears throat> I I tried this with Anne on Saturday and um, kind of knowing I would fail. And the first impulse, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people when I've heard it, is uh, that they start summarizing their story. They just start talking about like, well, here's what happens in the beginning. And they, they go from there. Um, and I'm just curious if you, if you guys, um, you know, if you did this, if you took this seriously and tried, were you doing that? Uh, were you, or were you, you know, trying to pay attention to what, what we were saying and not do that? Or um, yeah, where were you with this? And have you heard other people do this? Uh, in trying to describe their book? Do they launch right into sort of summarizing it? Yeah, like like if, if I were to do it with mine, I would be like, okay, so um, the first thing that happens is um, Katie calls, um, she, they, they get a call and they find out that Katie is in the hospital and Katie had cancer before. And so they all end up having to go to the hospital, but one of the friends, they're not very good friends anymore, so they fight. And so, but Katie says that she's going to ask them to do something kind of hard. And so that's not very compelling. You're kind right. of going, and who's Katie and what now? Exactly. And were they friends before? Like, why did they get a phone call? And so it doesn't, and Tim was funny because after he finished it, he said, my hands are sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's humiliating. It's actually like you realize as it's happening, like, I am totally not doing this story justice, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's a pretty good story, but man, I don't even like the story I just described. <laughs> I, I did, I was telling Ann on Saturday, my brother likes what I write. He's, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a fan of my writing. He's even like, he's taken one of my stories and adapted it into a short movie. You know, so here's my audience. Like, this is a person who's 100% an ally of mine. And, like, I saw him basically right before lockdown stuff, a couple weeks before the lockdown stuff. And and I was telling him my most recent uh, story I was writing. And, and just in the midst of it, I was like, yeah, he's not into this. He's not into this at all because I am totally screwing this up. You know, to talk about your story is so yeah. hard. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. So I was reading the comments and um, yeah, I, Marilyn said, I, I already wrote the pitch, but even when people ask me, I start telling them about the story and that's, God, it's so common. And, and right. I, and also I clutch up like the minute somebody says, so what's your book about? And then I'm like, Oh, um, and it's hard if you don't have something that starts, you know, it's about these two women who kind of hate each other, but they have to rescue their dog, their friend's dog, Cuss Country. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe I'll have another breath and maybe I still have their attention long enough to tell them a second sentence. Um, but, but yeah, it's so easy to go right into the story. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it can sound canned. Yes. It starts by describing her characters, which, yeah, I sometimes do that too. And that has mixed results as well. Um, yeah, it can. Yeah, it's not, it's absolutely not easy. If you have a really good friend that will listen to you, you know, for a while, <laughs> if you feed right. them somehow, you know, but, um, and they can kind of focus and listen to you. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's so hard to listen to somebody tell them about, tell about their book. I guess it's because mm -hmm. it's not real. And so people think, what well, why bother? She's never going to finish it or something. Right, right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, move through. Okay, yeah. So, right. So we want to talk about the story elements instead of the sequence of events. So, so that's what we want you to do. Um, they said I lost my voice. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's easy to do. That's very easy to do to lose your voice um, when you're doing it. Um, I I have a pretty strong voice, and I um, often have to rewrite my thing several times to get my voice in there. 
um, because you're so worried about the formula and getting it all right, it can get neutralized. Um, and also it's very hard if you have a, a funny voice or a sassy voice or something to come across correctly in that so that you don't put people off. Um, it's not easy. Uh, voice, I think, is one of the hardest things to add when you're doing it, truthfully. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised to hear you say that, Bobby. Yeah, for sure. Um, how about questions? Can we... Is there anybody that wants to ask a question right now? Yeah, bring the questions and we'll sort of talk through this too. We've kind of already gone over this, but again, right. just to emphasize like the, you know, you have a premise uh, or situation, the characters sort of in there here and now, mm -hmm. you introduce them and what their current sort of situation is. The premise is kind of this what if thing that kicks it off, uh, kicks off their desire really. We've got their desire a few of their conflicts and we're pretty cursory with that and a final question about the security blanket i mean mm -hmm. that's kind of what it comes down to and it's worth writing that out pretty short maybe even turning it into a sentence um like we saw um nikki has a, a sentence here a woman goes to china as an expat and after three children disappear joins in a search that leads her into the underworld of human trafficking you know to to like have that sentence and latch yourself to that to that sentence can really sort of be a beacon for the story. Mm -hmm. That's um, a good sentence. Yeah, yeah, That's for sure. Sentence. And I mm -hmm. wanted to quickly kind of come back to this as if, and again, have questions trickling in now, but this, here's the story structure that Anne has used. And you can really see, though we don't want to, when we're talking about our story and pitching it, it's there's not a sense of structure really, and yet, you know, the the situation and the premise is basically right here in this opening image and hook and em empathy plus the inciting incident, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really like here then is maybe that kicks off the desire at the end of the beginning. Um, you know, this middle point is this middle act is really all about the conflicts, uh, which then bring us back to uh, this final question about the security blanket. And that's what the climax and then denouement are going to sort of the climax is going to be that facing uh, that question about the security blanket and answering mm -hmm. it basically with the denouement. It's there, right? It's the the story. Yeah. And that's why structure, I do think there's some universality to structure, at least on a sort of large scale view of it, uh, because it's doing those things uh, that that story is. It's part of what, I mean, I think every story has a structure. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of like, you know, there's certainly varieties, just like every sentence has a syntax. Yep. You have a lot of options there. Yeah. But there's no sentence without syntax. Right. Um, I would say too, um, before I would start to write my pitch, I would read a hundred back <laughs> the backs of books. I would just uh -huh. take them off your bookshelf and read and read and read. Because there's something about the it's like it's like you wouldn't really write a limerick if you hadn't read a few limericks. Right there's this pacing and and way about reading it and saying it enough times that sort of gets in your brain so that when you are putting your own story there you have that um, structure that you've read enough times and it can help you um, and I I really do read a lot of them or did read a lot of them um, and I got good at them like I said because I would work at the New York Pitch and Shop and have to do 60 or something in mm. two days. And um, and often the stuff they gave me was the smallest of premises. And um, I would have to try to help them come up with something. Um, and often they didn't like it, um, <laughs> um, but often they didn't have a story. And mm. so I would try really hard to impose, you know, these ideas onto a story. Sometimes people, they were revelatory um and sometimes not but you know that's the nature of it so i would read a lot of them before i tried to write mine because um it's hard um questions here about the verbal pitch versus the written one yeah i think maggie's right about that i mean certainly you have more time when it's written um verbally i could never remember what i'd written so Usually my pitch is really just a log line, and we're going to talk about that on the last or second to last, whatever. Um, so yeah, Maggie, I think you're right that when I talk about 
when I'm telling somebody about my book, usually I'm trying, I'm just telling them in two sentences. And then if I'm usually, if I'm pitching or querying or something like that, then it's more of the one that we showed you. But, and if you are, if you are planning your book, it's the one that we showed you. It's the larger, longer one. So yeah, there's a difference between talking about it and using it the way that we're suggesting you use it. But is the difference, um, is the difference in the style of delivery and I mean, the, the elements for the story don't differ much. You're still no. talking about the same things. Yeah, you are. In fact, in some ways, the log line is no different. It's a character in a situation who tries to get what they want fa and fails. Right. And that's what the log line is. Um, and uh, so it's really the same. You just have a little bit more time um, in the larger paragraph. And certainly you want a little more time if you're doing it the way we're suggesting you do it, which is to use it as a blueprint for your book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, like, it's almost like, you know, I think good public speakers don't read off a teleprompter, you know, they, right. for the most part, it's, there's something more natural about the way they're delivering. You know, mm -hmm. you look at a good TED talk or something like that. And, um, or even like a, you know, to a certain extent, like a stand-up comic, you know, like mm -hmm. the the writing on the page is much different from their delivery of it, mm -hmm. right? So there's some of it's just that, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, other, Kate's also asking any, anything more about verbal versus written. Um, and you, Anne, you dealt with in, when you were with the fifth semester, you had a lot of people go out and talk to agents in New York mm -hmm. and what did, what did you observe there in terms of either in terms of their process or in terms of the actual verbal pitches that they were giving to agents? I mean, I think um, it's, a, it's a hard thing because people have bad memories and they get very nervous. Like I remember we had one woman pitching it to the agent. She couldn't remember the title of the book or her character's name. And I was oh. like, yeah, I know. I was like, maybe remember her name is man. She's like, yes. And the book is like, it was, just, oh, it was so hard. <clears throat> so, you know, we try to get them to be as succinct as possible. Um, sometimes we ask them to read it. Um, in a one-on-one -on -one pitch circumstance, often if you're going to be that nervous, you should just take your piece of paper and read it to them or hand it to them and have them read it. Um, or something like that. If you're in an elevator and you're having a moment and you get somebody's ear or it's your friend, a couple of sentences, the only thing they're gonna want to talk about, they're not really interested, they're nervous about it too because they don't want you to fail <laughs> or go on and on. So there's like some anxiety all around. Um, so when I've done it both at the New York Pitch and Shop, we usually have them read it because also they've only written it in like a day, so they don't really know it. And if it's at um, the fifth semester or if we're doing it at the Institute of Madison or something like that, um, I suggest that people use whatever they need to use to get past it um, and, and just do their best in telling the story. Usually what I find is that the people that don't have a good handle on stories are the ones that can't do the pitches. Mm -hmm. They just can't do the pitches. And then if they ask them questions they're ask the agents are almost asking the wrong questions because we they've been led astray by the person that's pitching. So then they end up saying they're like, "Is this a futuristic world?" And and really that should have been answered in the very first sentence, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a futuristic world with no oxygen and da da da. Oh, okay. So tell me again now, what is this character? That's a mess. So and I also think I just think it's people that no offense to them, this is very difficult. Right. Um, haven't organized their thoughts into every story is a character story. It's a story about a person who tries to get something when they fail, 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 and then they get something else. <laughs> um, and uh, off, and really that's what we should, because they'll often say, well, who is this about? Or what happened here? Or is this? And, um, and then everybody gets kind of wrecked. Um, but I think a little bit what we're doing is getting slightly far afield of the point of our pitch today, because our pitch for today is not necessarily pitching it or even using it in your query letter, but as a structure for your book. 
So just as a way to think about it for your book, really. And then um, I guess a follow-up from that is Maureen asks, how is a query to agent for a completed book different from the initial pitch? Oh, well, a lot of times it doesn't. It Sometimes it's no different. Sometimes it's, you know, depending on how much the book has changed, it's changed a little bit. But, um, but your agent query should be the best of what you can do going forward. Um, and so that it's really not that different. Um, it just is a good representation of your work. Mm -hmm. And um, and honestly, we could talk about that and we definitely could offer a whole class on how to do that easily, maybe a couple classes on how to do that. I'd be happy to um, because there is a lot of confusion about what is a pitch, what is a query, what is it? And often I find that it's just a lack of terminology that is easily used. Um, like right. when is it a pitch? When is it a synopsis? When is it a query? What is it? And so, you know, I think um, rare, you know, you, if you get a chance to do a verbal pitch, that you know, you go to conferences and you get this chance to do a verbal pitch. I, I think that those are great um, if you get a chance to. Um, I don't know that many people that make deals that way because I think it's really a hard hot seat for agents. I used to think it was the way to do it. Um, now I feel a little bit less like it is. I'm not really sure. Um, so. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, like it is, like a lot of the language is just sort of problematic because there's so many different, like query, for nonfiction is a totally different thing for query different. for fiction. And if you're like a query, if you're writing a short story, that query is like following up and saying, hey, I sent this a year ago. Yeah. <laughs> Have you read it yet? Like it's, they're totally different things, but they're all the same word query, right? Yeah, so that's, I, I can understand if there's some confusion about some of the questions about the terminology we're using um, because we do sort of swing in and out of them um, without referencing what we're using as definitions for those things. And I really believe it's because, in fact, in the fifth semester, we call that descriptive paragraph that we're calling a query or a pitch, we call it a nut graph, the small hmm. sort of descriptive paragraph of what your work is. We call it a nut graph because I think that um, journalists use a nut graph when they're talking about pitching a story. And so we started to use that term because it was getting everybody all screwed up. Um, so there's a bunch of questions about the security blanket and yeah. I, I feel like we should be a little bit clearer about that. And really what we're saying is like, so how does, for example, how, what's my security blanket where, where, um, conflict is concerned? Well, I can tell you what it is. It's make a joke. I, whenever things get uncomfortable, I make a joke. Um, and then I will do anything to get out of that conflict because I do not like conflict. So I will take on too much or I'll something, but it's not good, right? So what if I'm on a ride across country and my jokes aren't working anymore? My jokes were my security blanket. My jokes were the, the, the thing that I was holding on to, the coping mechanism that I was hoping, holding on to that isn't working anymore. So, for example, if we have a character say, um, like, for example, in The Hunger Games, maybe her coping mechanism, Katniss, was always to stay beneath the radar. Don't make any false moves. Don't let them know that you're around. Keep quiet. But then her sister gets called up, and she is going to have to be in The Hunger Games, and her coping mechanism to stay quiet isn't working anymore because what she really wants is her family to stay safe. So she's got to get rid of her coping mechanism, get rid of it, and now we need to know how is she going to survive. So that security blanket got really small really fast for her. Um, and so that I, does that help? Does that what, see, there's a lot of questions about security blanket, yeah. Right. So does that help a little bit, be a little bit clearer about what it is? So. So when we say a character in a situation who tries to get what they want in the way that they usually do it, and then it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work, and then it doesn't work, and they fail repeatedly, mm -hmm. and then something has to change. Mm -hmm. 
And so that security blanket is the way that they used to be. Well, we could have a session on how to get an agent. Yeah. Um, so does that help? Yeah. Um, Marty says, yeah, Krista. Yes. Um, there was another, there was a couple questions on pitches with T two POVs. Um, yes. I, I think that one of the best things you could do, honestly, and what I do as a, is a quick and easy way to do it is that I go and find another book with two POVs and see how they did it. Yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah. And so I'll say, sometimes I'll say like, so-and-so, is you know like sarcastic and so and so is um a pleaser and told in alternating points of view these two women have to xxx wow oh, right um so so sometimes i'll say it that way or mm -hmm. i'll say you know um i'll give the names of the two characters and then i'll say each with their own um difficulties and an intersection of a problem between them, um, both women will have to change in a way that they've never had to before. Both women will have to, or men or partners or whatever it is. So I look really hard for a book that has two point of views and then I kind of take a look at how they do it. Agents will sometimes tell you to pick the most, the strongest point of view and just write about that person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but there's lots of ways that you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and usually there is one point of view that's a little bit stronger than the rest. Um, and if there isn't, it's a good idea to make one stronger than the rest. Um, just because it does, it, it helps us, it helps everybody sort of figure that out. But it's not absolutely necessary. So, you know, I always say there isn't any real, there's all kinds of rules, but there's not any hard and fast rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um. Yeah. Yep. So yes, that helps. The, the security blanket is like a touchstone. Like uh, eventually she may discover that she doesn't need it anymore or that, yeah, it's just grown too small. It just doesn't work anymore. And that's kind of how we were thinking about it. And it can, it can be manifested in external objects and real world things. But really when we're talking about security blanket, we're usually talking about something yeah. that's pretty abstract. It's their coping yeah. mechanism, right? It's yeah. their it's a misbelief about like, you know, whether or not they have control of the world, for instance, or right. yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh, good. That's good. I'm glad you guys asked that question. Um, Amy Lou, would it still be a good story if the person didn't get what they were originally after, but got something yeah. else instead? Yeah. But then as a windfall, does it also get what they were originally after? Oh, it, well, yes. I mean, I would say, yeah. I mean, all of that is okay. Sure. As long as you sell it. Um, yeah. You know, and maybe it's like the ultimate wonderfulness. But usually, whatever it is, that character has to change. Because what we're interested in seeing how they change. Mm -hmm. You know, like the thing that's, the I'll tell you what, that's interesting. And I, we, I think we are very successful about not talking about the virus. But I do want to say this. The thing that everybody is most nervous about with regards to the virus is the uncertainty of it all, right? I think we right. can agree that we don't know what it's gonna look like after the virus. We don't know what it's gonna look like tomorrow. We don't know, we don't know. And the fact that we don't know is causing us incredible amounts of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so, I think that's what keeps people really interested in stories. We want to see how people are going to change. So I guess what I'm saying about the the virus is that the virus is change. People don't like change. So they have to be dragged through the mud to change. Like, this is not a political statement, but we can now see, it was so funny because I read this thing that was like, We'll never be able to slow global global warming, and then <laughs> they're like, "Oh yeah, here's the virus, right?" So um, it's like we might want change, but for us to really change, for us to stay inside and stop driving, we needed a pandemic. So if the story of the if we were writing a story in Earth 
was the protagonist or people on earth were the protagonist, it took a pandemic to get us to stop doing the same thing over and over. And so in your books, you have to really give your characters some hell. You have, because people don't like to change. I mean, one in two men die of heart disease and it's a preventable disorder. So if it's completely present preventable, which in most cases it is, um, speaking from a health professional standpoint, we know that if people stopped eating so much red meat and cheese and all the stuff that I love, heart disease would be much less, right? So, so but people are like, no, I like meat. So if you're going to get somebody to stop doing something, you almost have to kill them. You, you got to give them a heart attack. You've got to take away their security blanket. You have to make their lives miserable for these two women to decide that their friendship is worth something. Their best friend is going to almost, she's going to probably die. Like they have to die. Like they have stayed apart for years. For them to even consider getting back together, their friend has to die. And so when we ask people to change, they can get what they're originally after, but mostly they're probably not going to want that anymore. And maybe if they do get it, what they find out is that they don't want it anymore. And we all go, oh, and that's the lesson. Be mm. careful what you wish for. And I so love I love that. That the virus is a perfect novel. If you're, if you're going to get somebody to stop doing something, you almost have to kill them. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. But I know because, you know, I taught health for 30 years. As yeah. far as I know, nobody changed anything. Right. right. Every once in a while, I'd get an email that says, I drink more water now. And I'd be like, and the crowd goes wild. <laughs> you know? And um, so we are. We get to create change. We get to be the god of our stories. We get to change our protagonists. But, but like I would imagine, the Holy Ghost is. He'd be like, I am not going to be able to get that person right. to stop doing that until I take away every last vestige. Think of an alcoholic or a drug addict. They, when they say that those people have to hit bottom, they do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so and then change occurs. So you have to that's what's interesting about these stories is that you have to strong arm them so that in the end, they probably don't want what they thought they wanted. Mm -hmm. They're a different person now. So, yes, Amy, you can have that. But yeah. maybe the end of that story is and she got it anyway and she didn't want it anymore. Right. She's not a person anymore. She's been on a journey. Yeah. Well, we'll start wrapping up here, but uh, next session is next week, Wednesday on log lines and comps. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll explore some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can talk, we can add in that conversation about um, like how to get an agent as part of that. Like, I think that that also, it won't be a fully thing on how to get an agent, but it oh, definitely sure. is part and parcel of it. Of yeah. those that we talk about there. That'd be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you everyone uh, for coming. Again, there's the links for uh, tips if you feel so inclined and if you've gotten something of value here. Um, so we'll keep that up for a sec and uh, hope to see a lot of you next week. And thanks for coming and thanks for the questions. Um, like Anne was saying earlier, it would be it would be lovely if we could have you know these be a little bit more interactive. But yeah, I know I love at least the fact that we have questions and we're not just talking to a screen. Yeah, me too. I really like that, and I you know I worry that two talking heads are not very compelling. But like I right. hope that this is useful and and it makes sense. Yeah. yeah, but it's hard. I mean, I think you should just really hear us saying over and over that it's hard. You know, it is. So right. If you're feeling discouraged, you should. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> well, that was a positive thing to have. But it's but it is it's hard, but it is rewarding when you actually so rewarding. Can, it really it, it it. is. I mean it yeah. really is. All right. right. Thank you guys. Yes, thank you all. We'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>